Okay, so I've met uh, two thirds of you before and uh, David, nice to meet you today. So, and thanks Kit for inviting me to, to give this workshop. It's been something that I've wanted to do to start beginning to do better, more outreach on campus. And so this is kind of an appealing format, a small group where I can go through the material, but also have the opportunity for people to ask questions as we go and really you know, focus on the specific needs and specific questions that, that people have. So, so this is my group and we've been doing you know, a combination of, of grant funded and uh, like more ad hoc research. And now we're getting more into outreach and not just training, but um, enabling research more broadly throughout the College of Ag and Life Sciences here. So I have, I have organized this around this data management life cycle. And there's a few different sources that have really, that I've leaned on heavily for, for this pub, uh, presentation. One of which is Data One has a lot of great materials, a lot of great, great training materials. And there's actually a visiting scientist who I didn't list in the last uh, page, but a visiting scientist from the National Center of Ecological Analysis and Synthesis and her boss is also the PI of Data One. And she's a trainer. So she's also helped me develop this material. In any case, that's a great resource. And this is a data management life cycle. I think that you know, their, their resources are a good go-to place to get started. In any case, this can kind of be divided into two parts. One is the fun part that people think of when they're thinking about scientists is the discovery and the analysis. And then there's the, the hard work that goes into you know, collecting data, making sure that it's usable, doing the quality assurance, and et cetera. That's a, the focus of today's workshop. And to this, they didn't explicitly put this in their data management lifecycle, but there's also a key component, which is sharing. So increasingly, you know, science has moved from small, you know, within a lab, collecting the data, analyzing it and doing a publication, small public, you know, small author list to very large, you know, nowadays it's not uncommon to find very large consortia of people working together. And so a lot of the work I do, for example, I'm in a role of, of helping to build communication between people, you know, the scientists who are collecting the data and the, you know, uh, advanced statisticians and, and computer scientists who want, who want to use the data. And so in that context, it's really important to you know, be able to share the data and be able to effectively communicate about the data and let each other understand what exactly is going on, what the important questions are, and et cetera. Um, so, just starting with plan, how to plan to collect your data. This is something that comes up quite a bit, especially now, since fortunately, many funding agencies have begun to require data management plans. In fact, I don't think that I've had a, I've submitted a proposal recently that didn't require a data management plan. And it can be kind of daunting <clears throat> when you're asked to prepare a data man management plan. So for example, the NSF has you know, clearly defined sections about what types of data you're going to collect, what the data and metadata standards are, what your policies are for access, sharing, and privacy, and policies for reuse, redistribution, and, and data derivatives, as well as what your plans are for archiving and, and preservation. And finally, the roles and res responsibilities of the people on the team. So before I go further, I want to ask does anybody, has anybody here who's written a data management plan? I'm gonna assume that we have two people who have written data management plans. So I'm curious if you, either of y'all have uh, included the execution of the data management plan in your, in your funding request. Yes, I did. In fact, we just turned in one that is more than like 30 pages long to DOE. <laughs> uh -huh. and, and they were very meticulous, but they were very meticulous about it too. So 
Uh -huh. so, 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 so you explicitly ask in your budget for money to, to manage, store, archive the data? Yeah, and the interesting part for the, the, the DM we wrote is that they don't want to hold the date. They want us to place it into some like a, a, a data.gov or data one or one of the other places on, on the cloud. Uh -huh. So it's more for them to ensure that we follow whatever procedures more than them wanting the data. Okay, yeah. Um, and how about you, Kit? No, I've never written one and didn't know that there was a requirement now for, so this is news for me. Okay, yeah, so it's, a, it's an important requirement. And if I'm, on, if I'm reviewing your, your proposal, I will definitely look at not only the, the plan, but also whether or not you have planned carefully to actually execute it. Because, so that's the next part is, you know, don't forget to put it in your budget and your statement of work to, to execute it. So when I review a, a proposal and a data management plan, I look not only that it's budgeted, but also whether or not the people have already demonstrated their, the, the activities that they're proposing that they're going to work, that they're going to do. Like, do they have data that's been archived? Have they been putting their code on GitHub as, as they say that they plan to do? Right now, there's a big complaint that, you know, the data management plans don't have a lot of teeth. They don't, you know, there's no uh, real checking in and compliance. And really that, that comes primarily at the, at the review stage at this point. But I believe it will be changing move, moving forward. So when confronted with this question of, you know, how to write a data management plan, I think the best place to start is to go to this tool called the DMP tool. So the DMP tool is developed by the uh, California Digital Library, but most institutions, many universities participate. And so, and their librarians help to guide, uh, help to provide guidance. So if you can see in this example, each of those bullet points that I had on the last one on the last slide becomes something that you can open up and start writing in and it gives you guidance. So it gives you, you know, the general guidance for the, that the, the uh, funding agency provides. And then it also gives you guidance that can come from each individual institution. So in this case, I can't remember why I chose UT Austin, but usually if there's a number of institutions on the proposal, I'll see if there's guidance from, from their libraries, it will tell you some generic information as well as institution specific requirements or resources like what our library provides in terms of, of data archival. So this is very handy and absolutely I would, I would recommend that you use a DMP tool the next time you have to write a data management plan. And you can even share it. So I've made this one um, public. So you can see in here, um, well, uh, since I'm logged in, you can see it anyways, but just to give a little bit of, um, oh, here's the, the writing plan part. Let's see. So you, University of Arizona didn't give any guidance there. Wait, sorry, but they do down here for the archiving and preservation. They'll say that the UA data repositories um, is a place that you can you can uh, put your data. So we'll get into repositories later in, in the talk. I mean, it's really a great tool. So that's really so, all. Oh, yeah. So is this something that we should have um, placed on like our website in our business center or on our, so that our faculty know about this I, I tool? Mean, I, yeah, I think, I think that it would be worthwhile to tell the faculty about the tool. Um, and there are workshops that the library gives to introduce people to it, but it's pretty self-explanatory. If you, you know, I can actually, I could write a summary of some of the resources that I provide and send it out and, and um, for anybody who's not here, well, a lot of folks who aren't here uh, and include this in there. Um, yeah. So. Is it, yeah, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. <coughs>
Okay, so that, that's really, you know, it covers the planning part. I mean, not all of it, but a lot of the rest of the talk will include the elements of the plan. Because as you plan, you're going to need to know how to collect the data, which is the next step. And there's a lot of different methods of collection. I'm going to focus mostly on, on spreadsheets because a lot of times sensors are, will, will generate a pretty, you know, standard consistent data type and you have, and then there's ways in which you have to process those. I guess a lot, you know, or you can, you can create tables and the tables that those sensors should create will follow a lot of the same rules that a spreadsheet will create. Then there's lab and field notebooks, but typically the information in the lab and field notebooks will be transferred to spreadsheets. And also synthesis, just as somebody who does quite a bit of uh, meta-analysis for its own sake, as well as for you know, model parameterization, we do, you know, we're digging in the literature a lot to get numbers out of, out of the data, out of the literature, but often that is just putting it into spreadsheets again, organizing it in spreadsheets. And so there's two, two citations here. The first is, you know, simple guidelines for effective data management. And I, I say, uh, some of their rules kind of say, don't use spreadsheets, you should use all text files, etc. But they're not, it's not really that practical. In practice, spreadsheets are very powerful. And also, you know, since this was written only about 12 years ago, there have been a lot of advances in the way, you know, in spreadsheets. Um, Excel itself has improved, but the uh, both Microsoft and Google provide, you know, online collaborative spreadsheets similar to Google Docs that you can collaborate on and you can also version. You can now in Google Spreadsheets version individual cells. So it's spreadsheets are not have, have are not and probably never will be the the gold standard for archival purposes, but for the development of data sets. So in this part of collection and organizing and QAQC, they're very important. So this paper data organization and spreadsheets is says this is how to use them. And so we'll go through some of these different topics. <clears throat> so There are other types of, of data storage formats beyond just tables that I'm going to focus a lot of my, the next few slides on. As I've mentioned, I'll talk a little bit later about images, point clouds, and HDIF5 slash NetCDF data, which have a lot of great value. Those are, those are called binary formats. And those allow, uh, they allow data to be compressed quite a bit. So you can get a lot of data in one place. They also allow you to uh, quickly access the data. So when you're talking about gigabytes of data, you can't, it's, the computer has a hard time reading through text files and, and figuring out what's in there without some information about what's going to be in there. Databases similarly are, are efficient for, for accessing data. And to a lesser extent for, for storing data or for archiving data. Usually if you want to archive a database, the recommendation is to dump it out into something like a NetCDF file or a, or a text file. So <coughs> I, I wanted to start out with these, with these best practices that, that Bohr et al. put out there, even though they they very much say don't use spreadsheets essentially. They say use a scripted program for analysis like R and Python or MATLAB. Uh, store tech, store your data in a text file, like a CSV file. Um, uh, store the data in non proprietary hardware formats. And always store uh, an uncorrected data file with all of its bumps and warts. So that's that's an important part. So there should you should always, when you collect the data, you should you know, no matter how you process it, you should always keep that original data set because you may want to go back to it or other people may want to go back to it. So once you clean it up and et cetera, there are, you know, there are different ways of doing that. And we'll talk a little bit about maintaining the provenance. 
the the idealized way is to use a scripted program so to take it in use the use software to interactively you know clean up your data and reorganize it but usually it's or in a lot of cases it's easier to do this within within a spreadsheet and so while a scripted program the idea is that it can exactly it's exactly reproducible and that's ideal it's just a it's a cost benefit of how much time it takes to to script an uh, script a data cleaning uh, process versus doing it the way a lot of people are familiar with and is handy with the interaction of a spreadsheet. <clears throat> but if you don't use a scripted anal uh, program for analysis, then it's recommended that you keep a, keep track of all the steps between that uncorrected data file and the data that is used later in analysis. So I've talked a little bit about organization um, sharing and versioning and, and more about the limitations of spreadsheets. Uh, so this woman, Jenny Bryan, is a professor at the University of British Columbia, and she also works at, at R Studio. And she's developed a lot of R tools that enable the use of spreadsheets. So it used to be very hard to use spreadsheets, but now some of the tools she's created help to reorganize, help to clean up a lot of the messy parts that we'll discuss in the coming slides. It helps to extract components. <clears throat> and it can also connect to Google uh, to a Google Sheet. So you can have a Google Sheet and you can access it directly rather than having to uh, save it as a CSV file. It's still better to save it as a CSV file and have a text-based representation that's kind of the canonical one that everybody's using and isn't modified or, or you can always tell if it's been modified. But in practice, it's also very handy to be able to, you know, pull down the data from a spreadsheet, at least for the QAQC and, um, and exploratory data analysis steps. So this paper comes through with, with, an, with a lot of best practices for, for spreadsheets. And in this workshop, it's difficult to go through all of the detail in each of these. And I highly recommend reading this paper. I don't know any other way around it. It's, but it's kind of like a lot of these steps are, I, they're analogous to when I first started working in a lab and, and there's all these laboratory protocols. There is some, you know, I had to read the MS, um, well, no, I forget what, what it was called, but the, uh, the, the material safe, the MSDS, a material safety data sheet for each Thing in the lab, I had to read the protocols. I had to learn how to how to work. The same thing goes for both software and data. There's best practices, and in order to have data that can be reused not only by yourself but also by others, it's necessary to follow these best practices. So, David, this, yes. Uh, eventually, would you be able to give us that citation? So that we, it's a, a little difficult to see in the, um, yeah, in, in what looks to be like a business card size. Um, yeah, it's a screen clip. I've got, um, I've got okay. a page of, um, of, of references and another page of, of Perfect. other resources at the very end. Yeah. Okay. Thank uh, you. Uh huh. Yeah. So, so one is to have consistent variables and and file names. Um, it is. I'd say more common than not to, to find data that's collected over many years to have small differences in variables naming names that make it difficult for a computer to understand. So if you have the name of a species and in one year it's an abbreviation and another year it's you know written out with a, with a space in it, another year it's um, so a letter is capitalized or not, those are all understood by a computer as being different entities and they, it's hard for the computer and in many cases even the human to easily be certain that these variables mean the same thing if their names are, are inconsistent. And by good, um, naming variables, sometimes people name them you know, sequentially by letters A, B, C, D, but it's better and easier to have long variable names that are human readable. And we'll see some of those, some examples of those in a few slides. When I talk about metadata, 
So dates, I think probably the only standard I've come across that is, that there's no question about it. Nobody really will argue about this. I, I, I take that back, somebody will, I'm certain it's happened. But for the most part, putting your date in a year, 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 month, month, day, day format is the standard. And so they should always be encoded like this and then hours, minutes, seconds. And then there's other ways to put the, and then there's a few ways to put the time zone at the end. This is an ISO standard that is unambiguous. <clears throat> and it also has a handy feature of sorting um, by date, as opposed to if you put the day first, for example, or the month first, you won't be able to sort easily by date. I name a lot of my files, a lot of my files this way. So all of my presentations, for example, I start with the year, 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 month, month, day, day. And it's nice because it makes it easy to, to organize. Um, there's a lot There's a lot of meaning that somebody can get out of an empty cell. Like was the data not collected? Was the, you know, was something not there or was the data not collected or was the data collected and lost? It's not, it's not clear. There's, there can be a lot of problems with empty cells. So having NA um, instead of an empty cell is useful. I mean, it's recommended. There's also a lot of cases in which you will see other values standing in for missing data. Commonly, you might have a file type that won't allow you to put a text in a number field and people will use negative 9999 <laughs> for something similar for missing data. And it can, you know, it that can be useful, but it can also result in errors that you, that you won't know about. So if you take the mean across this, a vector and one of the numbers is negative 9999, it'll throw it off and you won't know um, what it is. The other... Us, Matt still uses the minus 9999 here on campus. <laughs> <laughs> who, who does? <laughs> Uh, as Met, Arizona oh, Meteorological, yeah. you know, the group here on campus. Yeah. yeah. I will, okay. I will, uh, they're getting a new, a new coordinator. So hopefully I can. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Chat with him about it. Um, okay. So, so having one, one type of information for cell. So not like if you've got a name, not combining it with, you know, also with the date of collection. Um, I've, in some cases it's, it's useful to do that. But in other cases, uh, but it makes life more difficult further down the line. I'm going to talk a little bit about what this means about making it a rectangle. But this is one of the key ideas in developing tabular data: is to is if you think about your data as um, as an object that you want to add rows to. So every time you make a new observation, you can add a row and not have to add a new column. And the reason is, is that if you come in and you add a new column, you're going to end up with a lot of empty, a lot of missing data. And so, you know, the question is, how can you, how can you organize your data so that you can add rows rather than columns? And I'll talk a little bit about that when I describe data normalization. Um, you know, the caveat is that a lot of times it's useful and a lot of, you know, a lot of, uh, Statisticians, computer scientists, they just want a big matrix of numbers. They want everything in a column. Fortunately, it's relatively straightforward to reorganize data on the fly for analysis to reshape it. But for the purposes of, of collecting and storing data, it's better to add, to, to organize it in that way. And we'll describe that when I talk about data normalization. So having a data dictionary. So it's useful in a spreadsheet when you have multiple worksheets to be able to have one page that's a readme, and we'll talk about readmes in a second, and then have another page or included in the readme, the data dictionary, which says, identifies each header, each uh, the name of each um, column in your, in your spreadsheet. When saving it as a CSV file, often you'll see all this information contained in a, in a header. It'll be like a, um, a number sign, which means it's commented out. It helps the uh, programs ignore that or identify it as, as a comment. And then it has all the, all the definitions. So that's how ASMET provides their data, for example. Um, but the idea is that every, you know, 
having the name is not enough if you don't know what the units or what the meaning is. And the other, this gets back to that other best practice that from the from the other paper we were talking about that the, the um, in the previous slide, which is not to do any calculations in your raw data files or worksheets. It's another great thing about worksheets. You can bring the raw data file, you can you can copy one worksheet into another worksheet and start to organize it, do summary statistics, et cetera, statistics, et cetera. But including that in the raw data file, it messes it up and it makes it often harder to recover. Although, as I said, there's you know, there is versioning in, in spreadsheets now, it's still more more trouble than it's worth. This is an easy way of not having to um, having to wonder what your data originally was. Also, you know anything you can't export as a as as a text as a piece of text or a number shouldn't be your data. Highlighting is is useful. It's useful for when exploring the data. Excel has some great tools for highlighting according to number. To identify, you know, for exploratory data analysis, but you know, identifying you know s some important piece of information by color is is asking for for information to be lost, and also use data validation to to avoid errors. So one of the great things about spreadsheets is that you can identify, you you can say you know what happens in each column. So each column, you know, this column must be a character. You must have text in it. And this column must be a number. This column must be decimals. And you can also provide ranges to, to throw errors when you try and enter incorrect data. Okay, so now here's a question for the audience. Um, there are some problems with this spreadsheet. Most of them I think I've described, and I'm curious if uh, if folks can identify any. Feel free to send me comments. There's, so there is a calculation. Yep, there's one right here. Yeah, and the whole column P is a calculation. Oh yeah, uh-huh. And same with Q. Yep, awesome. And you and they highlight and you used highlight for the total. Yeah, that's a okay. So I think in this case the highlight isn't representing data. Oh, but, okay. But I mean that column shouldn't be there in the in the first place. So that's a good point. So I got curious about that you want to add rows and not columns. Why? Why? Is having rows with zeros worse than columns with zeros? No. So, you know, when you're saying don't add columns, because there's going to be a whole bunch of zeros, but if you have a row, you could have a whole bunch of zeros. So, I, I guess I'm not, it's not clear to me the difference. Okay. Yeah. So, so when we get, um, maybe it'll get clear when I'm, when I, talk about data normalization in a few slides, but the idea would be that, so, uh, the, I mean, the, the zero, if, if, you, if by zero you mean missing data, you, you would just not add that. Like, so if you add a column, so if, you, if all of a sudden I came back and I was like, oh, well, I wanna, I just measured a root on this tree. I wanna keep the biomass of that root. Then I would have to have like no information from any of these um, individuals, except for the, this entire column would be empty, except for that one place where I add a root. Right. If I reshape this so that, um, let's see, so, so we have species tree, then we would have, um, uh, like the, uh, the organ, you know, trunk, limbs, branches, leaves, roots, then I could have this column and maybe not every individual would have every single organ measured, but you would only have, you, you could add one row and say, this thing has a root and it weighs this much. So, okay. so the missingness is Im implied by the fact that there's no row for the other individuals. 
I see. Um, okay, and uh, okay, so any other, anything else here? Come on, folks, don't let me be Caught the only one. <laughs> Caught them bees mixed up text and numbers now? Yep. Yeah, that's correct. That's pretty messy. Yeah. There's also some spaces in the names which can cause some trouble, but that's... Yeah. Any Anything else? You said no empty cells, like so H would be a, a whole column of empty cells. Yep, that, that actually gets it at an even bigger problem that we'll get oh. to. <laughs> because if you go across, we have S S E S E, and then it turns into tree, and and oh no, the next one down is S E S E, but then it becomes P S M E. So they're not the same. So on the same row, you have different information. Yeah, yeah. And there's also some evident, um, some comments up in here, these little things right here, um, which won't get exported if you put it into a, into a data set, I mean, into a, if you export it into a CSV file. So I've got a few, few examples of what, what could be improved here. So first, there's actually three tables here. Yeah. And so, and it's not clear what they, you know, how they're related, or if one is a summary of another. Another, as as Kit, as you pointed out, these are all the, are they the same same observation or no? I think, from what I can tell, they're not the same observation because you have two species in the same row, and also, is this all the same variable? No, this is, as you pointed out, that's a total. You have these marginal sums down here. And so th this is a type of sheet that might be useful for reorganizing data as kind of a sandbox, but it should not be the way that the primary data is, is stored or, or shared. Um, this is kind of using the, the spreadsheet as a, yeah, a sandbox or, or, or a sketch pad not as a way of, of maintaining uh, data. I guess when I say sketch better, explore, you know, taking sums is essentially exploratory data analysis, which is great and, the, and spreadsheets can do it, but it shouldn't be confused with the, with the raw or with the, you know, canonical uh, data. Okay, so, so this rule that I mentioned earlier was when you add data to a database, you try not to add columns, rather you design your table so that you would add only rows. So this is one, one way of, of seeing this, this transformation. So as I was mentioning, you know, a statistician may want to see this format that says no over here. They, they may want to throw this into an analysis and it, it might be useful in some, in some cases. But for the collection and, and sharing of data, having it organized, reorganized, in this way, which is analogous to what I was what I was trying to explain in the last slide, is essentially taking it from what's considered a, a wide format to a, a long format. So in this case, if you came back to, um, you know, say that you came to site to the third site, and there was a species a, a, a species six, <coughs> then in this case you'd have to add one more column. And in fact, if you were going to very different sites and you would have a lot of missing data. Whereas in this, uh, you know, over here, you could have different species in every single plot, but you'd always have three columns. And that's important because if you're building software or writing a, you know, a, a script to analyze these data sets, it's useful if you can write it so that you're always expecting the same shape of the data, as well as same column names and, and same data types. So this is, this is, what I mean by adding rows and what would be considered tidy data. And I mentioned this word earlier called normalized data, which I won't get too far into, but it is a nice way of, of organizing your data. One way of, 
thinking about it is that you have this table, you have the site, the species name, the abundance. You may have your readme file that says, you know, that describes like site. This this means, you know, this is a, a string that is a you know a way of describing or is a name for this location. But some of the things that are missing here are um, and importantly that I would like to know probably if I'm if I was looking at species abundance is you know where this was collected and when. So there's a missing data, I mean a missing date column, but just to illustrate the idea of normalization. So you could have a latitude and a longitude column in here, but that would require that you have a, you know, five different rows that repeat exactly the same number, which again can, can be useful. But if you wanted to come back and change that number, then you'd have to change it in all five rows and you'd have to make sure you sorted your, your data sheet so that you see all those cases where you have this particular site and you want to change that number. But if you have a separate table and you have a site and you have a latitude and a longitude, then you only need to record that once for each site. So that's the basic idea of data normalization. And so I'll, I'll show that a little bit more here. Um, so this is kind of another, another way that you might collect um, species data, different um, so at this, at this, um, uh, so this is a good, this is actually a, another good practice for collecting tabular data is always to have an ID field. So you always know what that row is. And I just was reminded of it, even though in looking at these papers, I don't think that I, I saw that um, brought up, but the, so you have the date and you have the site ID that's just numbered site name, presumably. Uh, the temperature at that site when it was collected. Now you have two pieces of information for each species. So species one, the code for it, and species two, code, species two, height. So this is kind of the war wide format. We have the same problem again. If we wanted to record another piece of information, say the diameter of this of a tree or, or a third species, then we would have to add additional, a lot more um, additional columns. And so, so if we look here, so we've got um, some information about the, uh, about the plant species here, got information about the site, and we've got some information about each species in, inside this data set. So how can we, how can we take these and, and you know, normalize the data set? So you go from, from this, if you reorganize it like, like so, um, you can see again, you can go from the site ID and from that site, you can have the name and the temperature. I would still like to see some latitude and longitude. Um, but then again, you, you don't have to keep track of the numbers of the species. You have one column that contains all the information identifying species, one column uh, and containing all the information identifying height. There's one more step that you could do to normalize this, it may or may not be useful depending on the context, which is to have in this, in this final column, you could have just the variable and then have a, you know, have this list say height. And I mentioned earlier, height, diameter, height, diameter, and then here have the value. And so to be truly normalized, well, it's hard to say truly normalized because there's always this, you know, there's like the computer science theory approach, and then there's really the practical approach. And so, um, and there's, you know, like six steps to, to normalization. So it's really a matter of what's practical, but the next step of normalization would be to, would be to name that, you know, a, um, a variable and then have the value over here. And you could actually, you know, you could squeeze it down even further to probably two columns if you, if you went extreme, but that gets to be where it's, uh, not useful. So this right here, you know, the, the idea here is that you have one entity, you have one species at one site, and this is the information that you have about it. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about what it, uh, uh, methods of, of sharing data. <coughs> and 
as I mentioned, I'm gonna you know focus on spreadsheets, sharing and versioning them. So in practice, it's the most effective way of, of you know not just collecting it, but but um, conversing about it. It's very difficult to follow those rules of you know always collecting data in CSV files. First of all, because there aren't very good um, editors, uh, see the the way in which you you naturally edit a CSV file is to go in and edit a text file, which doesn't give you the column, doesn't give you all the power of a spreadsheet. And also, now that we have online shared Google Docs, it's really it's a really powerful way of, of being able to share data and get feedback on it. You know what's needed and what's not. And in a lot of cases, it's you know there's a lot of iterations between the data collector and the data user to figure out where um, what uh, uh, the, the best way to organize the data and what data is actually needed. Um, so versioning, you know, one way, probably the, the most common way in the way that I and probably many people started out is this is illustrated in this comic of naming your files. And, and that is a very useful and powerful way of versioning your files. But now there are even better ways of doing it. So if you were to use your, you know, the file naming conventions, and then this is a case where, you know, having a date would make it so that you don't have to, um, you know, you can, you can sort it and you don't have to remember, you know, what each of these comments that you've added to the name of it actually means. Um, so we won't get away from this anytime soon, but the, the sooner we do, I think the better. Um, so I threw this in there because, so I, I didn't get a lot into, you know, project management or, or using Git and GitHub in this, in this workshop. Um, Git is a way of versioning text files. It's most commonly used for, for managing code for software and for sharing it and working collaboratively on it. However, it's also can be used for, um, for text files. So at, to, you know, at a particular size, so some few thousands of rows at the maximum, you can actually check these text files into GitHub and you can look at them and you can see the changes, you can track the changes. It's not ideal. There's a lot of problems and reasons why this doesn't exactly work for, um, for data in the same way it does work for you know, text files that you uh, like software. And so there's a number of, so of, of new projects trying to figure out how to do Git for, for data. Um, so let's see. Um, well, yeah, I was going to provide this example of, of a data set that, that we're working on for a project that is really just curating data sets from, from, uh, from Neon for our collaborators uh, to, to analyze. And so first you, you see, we, we've said that this is all Neon's data. Um, it's all public domain. So we don't, you know, we don't technically have to say anything about data use since it's public domain, except, I mean, from a legal standpoint, but from the, from the scientific standpoint, you have to tell people where your data come from. And so we'll get into that later when we talk about licensing. But um, I just wanted to, to show, so here we've got um, the soft, the code used to pull this data down from, from the NEON uh, API. And then we've got this CSV file that, well, it's probably, it's too big to view raw, but this, this CSV file that we can share with our collaborators. Um, and then also issues, you know, so we've got some requests for um, changes to the data and, and we can link these two changes in, um, in any of the text files that are, that are in this repository. So again, GitHub is really powerful. It's very useful for scientific collaboration. It's, a, I don't know, I mean, I, I don't even want to say that it's outside of the scope of data management, but, um, but it, there's enough material to describe Git and GitHub that it could easily be its own, you know, workshop or three. 
Um, and, and finally, I wanted to say, you know, so, so databases, they're, they're designed to handle row-wise versioning. So there's a, a, um, a very simple way in which you can use, you can, you could take a, you know, a text file or a table and, you know, mark one row as having been superseded by another row. So you, so essentially, rather than looking at how this text has changed, like you might do in track changes, you just have one row and it says this row is no longer valid. Go see the next, you know, row five million and two. And you go down to five million and two, and it's essentially that that uh, row, except it's been uh, it is now valid. So that's also beyond the scope of most of this talk because I don't really get into um, how to use databases too much. But the idea is there that instead of like deleting a row or changing a cell, you would just mark that as wrong and add a new, add the correct row at the at the end. Um, so th there's a lot of ways in which to, you know, I, I, I threw this under advanced data sharing. So using Google Drive and Box, I think are, are you know, nice. And I should add the Microsoft, um, Microsoft is also pretty much feature um, compatible or not compatible, but it's got equivalent features as, as Google Drive and Box. You can also, you know, collaborate on, on the same uh, spreadsheet, for example. Um, I, I will talk in a, uh, next about the Open Science Framework, which I think is a really powerful tool for organizing uh, work that integrates a lot of different components that we've discussed so far. For, for very large data sets. And so I know Kamel, you, you have an interest in this. I'm happy to, to, um, to discuss in more in detail. One thing I'll say that's neat is that Google Drive provides unlimited data storage for anybody at the University of Arizona. I think anybody with an educational um, account, you know, G Drive account, you can put unlimited data. And I have actually tested this out and you can put up to you know, 750 gigabytes a day onto Google Drive, which is a tremendous amount of data for them to provide it to us unlimited. Is, is there like a, sorry, David, but is there like a mechanism to gain that unlimited access or is it open to everybody? It's open to everybody. Because I'm paying, I bought a, I bought two terabytes and I'm paying almost like a hundred dollar a year for it. I use it as a big repository for my stuff. So I'm not really sure. Are you certain? Yeah, I'm fair. I'm fairly certain. Um, okay. I mean, huh. do you have it? Are you using your um, U of A G Drive account? No, actually, I use it on top of my uh, Gmail account, my regular Google account, and I have my U of A box separately. But my Google Drive has kind of grew over the last number of years, mm -hmm. and then I outgrew it and I had to buy. So they offered me a uh, hundred dollar two terabyte disk limit. That's kind of how it was at the time. Okay, I'll explore it. Maybe there's a way around it. Yeah. Yeah. So so uh, go ahead. I was say, just like for OneDrive, everybody who has, I think, Microsoft Office gets a OneDrive, but there's a OneDrive University of Arizona, which is different. And it has like 10 times, I don't know, 10, it's 10 times more space than Box has. It's a huge amount. But I also was told that Google Drive, probably Google Drive U of A will have the unlimited. So you need to have Right now, Google doesn't know that you're part of a university. So you have yeah. to go through the university system and probably get a U Google Drive University of Arizona, which is tied then to the university so that they know you're academic. Oh, okay. I didn't, I wasn't aware of this. Okay. I just found out about it on Friday. <laughs> well, that saved me a hundred dollars. I'd be paying it out of pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think I've got almost 100 terabytes on, on Google Drive now. Okay, very good. There's, there's some question, I mean, like the, one question that you'll have to address, I think maybe moving it from Google Drive to Google Drive won't be as hard, but, but moving it from a server to Google Drive. Um, well, I had, I used Globus and I spoke with Blake um, Joyce at, at the UITS, at the HPC Center, um, about, you know, figuring out how to do that. But it, it's, it's possible to do. It's just... Um, I mean, as far as like, they say that it's unlimited, but when you actually, when you're uploading it from your desktop, especially from home, there it's a lot of data to be moving, you know, hundreds of gigabytes a day and whatnot. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, for, for a few terabytes, you can do it, you know, relatively slowly over the course of a few weeks and should be okay, especially if it's already within Google Drive. Um, and, and I didn't talk about databases and APIs. That's, that's also like very rich, you know, topic. Um, a lot of information and a lot of power there to organize your data and make it accessible and make it searchable, especially when you get to bigger data sets. The one thing I'll, I'll say about, well, there's so much to say. So the, the one thing I was gonna say about APIs, because people often hear about databases and a, data, a file, a CSV file can be considered a database. Often when people say databases, they're thinking of something like um, MySQL or, or Postgres something that's got, you have a server and it's running this program and it's ma managing your data. And it makes it efficient to be able to search and, and actually do um, analyses on data. So there's a lot of math, you know, basically you can program a database and whether you're using Python or MATLAB or R, you can do a lot of the computation in the database and make it much more efficient because you don't have to read it all into memory. So if you have more data than your memory then the databases are a great way to do that. And then I'll mention APIs real quickly because there's a lot of talk of, you know, data exchange formats. Um, APIs are ways in which you can uh, make data available on the web and also coerce data no matter what your, as long as you've got the information, no matter what your data looks like under the hood, the APIs provide a layer to conform to community standards. And so that's, that's pretty powerful. That means that your data storage can change and your API, like the what, the what, how the data storage stored can change based on your need and how the data is provided can always be the same. Um, so again, this, this is all advanced, but uh, I will talk a little bit about the open science framework. Um, I've been using it in my group and what it does, you know, so you may come away from this and say, wow, you know, there's GitHub and Google drive and, you know, wikis, Etc. How do I, you know, how can I like make this all um, in a coherent, put it all in, in one way, in a, in, a, in a coherent way, in a co coherent fashion? Um, and then you might say that, but but I also don't want to like add one more tool to my toolbox or or move migrate everything. So this is a nice way in which to, um, uh, or I guess, a nice middle ground between the two. Um, because it allows you to link a lot of the storage like Google Drive and GitHub um, to like a, an interface that allows you to maintain and develop materials. So I'll um, show you. So one, there's, there's a wiki. So this opens up the wiki and you can you know, maintain your wiki there that describe your data. Um, this, there's a lot of storage providers that you can um, link into. So Google, all, all the ones box, Google Drive, Microsoft, <clears throat> um, I think Globus, uh, any case, so, so you can link to those and you can open it up and you can actually, you know, not like navigate the file system. And in some cases for some file types, edit the files um, within this, this interface. And then, um, and you can actually, you can get a citation for this. So you, so you can like mark it at a particular time and you know, essentially archive the content, not all the content. I mean, the caveat is it's not all the content in all of these linked drives, but it is all of the text content in here. And it's just, you know, it, it provides a, um, a reliable way to link to this information. And finally, there's all these components down here. So you can, so you can nest it. So within a lab, you could have like your lab overview and then you can have, you know, for each project or each experiment, you can have a different component and store all of the information associated with that. Um, so, 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 yeah, so that's important. It can, it can become part of your data management plan and be a nice place to, to store and organize all of your um, documentation, metadata, notes, et cetera. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about validation. This is probably my, my shortest se section although it's the, you know, one of the most important. And the reason is because it's hard to come up with a lot of general statements about- um, uh, David, can I ask a question before? Uh-huh. Yeah, please, uh, have you ever worked with data.gov at all? Um, 
it's, a, it's a it's a cloud repository to work mostly for like kind of government stuff. Yeah. So I mean, my, my understanding is that it's a um, what what is it called? It's like it's sort of like data one is a um, it, it aggregates a lot of places, right? So it, it, it aggregates all these government funded data repositories. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. So, so, so when you ask if I work with it, so I've used it to search for data and then I've, I have deposited data at the National Ag Library, which is indexed by data.gov. Yeah. So the mechanism is very similar to kind of like some other play, maybe like repositories in a way? Yeah, well, I, so, so I, don't, I don't know that uh, the data.gov is a repository itself. Um, I could check into that, but I, I mean, I think that, that you would go to, um, you know, whether it's NASA or, or USDA or, or, um, or what, they would have like their repositories that you can, um, you put your data in and then data.gov is, is a way to search across all of the government repositories. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, if you want, we can take a look. Um, it's, it's really been a, a great, um, you know, it's, it's a great way to be able to search across a lot of data sets. Huh. Um, but, uh, uh, oh no, oh, my, my connection really isn't very good. Oh no. Uh -huh. okay. Have I been breaking up? I'll just say NDVI, let's see what we can get in there. Um, so if you look through here, let's see. Um, you can see all the standard, you know, stuff. You can, you know, you can search it, federal mm -hmm. government. So, it, so it's like aggregating it from all these different places. And I see, I see, I see. Yeah, and and any of these, um, like so, all of these repositories are where you can put the data. But there's no place okay. here to, um, I mean, I, that, that I'm familiar with to to deposit your data. I think you would yeah, use yeah. your appropriate one. So I got gotcha. you. Mm -hmm. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, QAQC. Um, so so the 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 uh, the gold standard for for data validation is to enter the data twice to essentially have two people collect the same data and enter it and compare it and make sure that they're the same. In many cases, that's that's really impractical. Although one of the things I've done is I've had you know, when, when extracting data from, from publications, have somebody, uh, one person extract the data and then somebody else go back and, and verify that they can see this data point came from this location in the paper. So that's uh, pretty close to that. Um, the, the other tool that I mentioned above is that, you know, spreadsheets and, and databases, you can add, add value constraints on any particular column. You can either say this has to be one of these different values, either like this could be true or false, or this, like you could have um, a list of sites that are in your, your sites table, as we discussed earlier, and make sure that anytime you enter a value in there, it, it you know belongs to that predefined group, or you can say it must be an integer and give it a range or a decimal and give it a range, or really with text, you um, there's, there's a way of programming almost any way of characterizing text so you could almost you know say it must have this exact pattern you know that's how websites validate if it's an email or a website or or whatnot um, so so there's a lot of power in in having a spreadsheet that has uh, value constraints as far as making sure that the data that you enter is valid um, now the the key is that it's a lot of hard work. So, you know, not, not only is it hard work to set up, but it's also, it's quite a pain when you're trying to enter data and all of a sudden it won't let you, you know, enter the data. Like maybe because the range that you gave is really, um, it was too narrow or, or something. And so you have to go back and, and change it. But in the end, it's worth it. Um, so one of the databases I use quite a bit is very picky. It makes sure that every time you enter something, it's got, you know, the appropriate, the minimum information that's required that, and then there's all these relationships among different tables. And it's, it makes life difficult a lot of times. However, it also prevents entering data that's not useful. So, so 
that, you know, adding con this, uh, this tool called constraints, which is relatively straightforward to implement in, in spreadsheets is very powerful. You can also, if you're using form-based um, data collection, you can also um, like surveys and such, you can also validate data at the time of data entry. Google Forms, for example, provides a lot of options for validating the data that's, entry, that's entered. Um, exploratory data analysis, which is a whole other workshop that I look forward to, to giving someday, is, you know, gets into that fun part of dealing with data, which is to, you know, you finally collect it, you got in this boring table, let's start looking at it. And that's one place to, you know, you can find out layers and et cetera. It's, it's such an, you know, inherent part of, of science that um, I'm sure that y'all are familiar with it. Um, the, the real question is, you know, when to exclude a, you know, data and sometimes it's not always clear, but it is important with two, there are two things I'd like to convey. One is that there, there should be a reason why, like, you know, if somebody measured a tree and it was, you know, like five kilometers tall, then you say, well, this, you know, is outside this range of plausible values, something must be wrong. The first thing you might say is, well, maybe it's not five kilometers, maybe it's five meters, um, but you would want to know that there's a, a reason why uh, you either change the data, the, the value, or you you exclude the data, <clears throat> um, or because an instrument has gone bad is a, another very common way um, reason to exclude the data. But it shouldn't be because it's an outlier. That's how like you know that's that's how reality um, gets uh, washed over, um, and uh, and is not scientifically valid. The other important thing. So even you know. Even, you know, even if you're not sure if it should be excluded, but you exclude it, you know, it's not uncommon to read in a paper where they said, you know, here's the analysis. Yeah, I didn't see anything, but, you know, there's this one outlier. I don't understand why it's there. Uh, if we reanalyze it without that outlier, then these are the patterns that I see. So this is all about, you know, you state your assumptions. You can describe these things in, in your readme or in your metadata, why the, why the data is gone. Um, but the, uh, yeah, so that's, I guess that, that's what I'll say about uh, the data validation. Um, okay, so describing the data. So this is um, probably, thank you all for, um, for being here. And uh, we're about to get into a part of the presentation that some people may find uh, incredibly boring. This is, you know, if, if you remember back at the beginning, I was like, well, there's a fun part over on the left and this is a, you know, it's like, ah, it's just so much work. And, and it really is a lot of work to have to, you know, describe your data. I mean, I guess, I mean, all steps are, are really a lot of work, but this is sometimes, you know, often the, the sticking point where it's, you know, uh, it's like, well, I, I just want to get my paper out. You know, why do I have to write up my, my readme's and all that? And really it's, it's the difference between the ability to use your data for a particular analysis and then publish the results and the ability for people to actually make use of your data in the future. And so this is a nice figure that kind of shows, you know, that the, uh, the, the timeline of, of information content of the data. And, you know, so at the time, the time you're collecting the data, you know, everything. But if you don't write it down, you start to lose, you know, specific details, maybe general details later. Finally, you just have this big table of, of numbers and a few names, and you're not really sure um, what happens. And so this is kind of a, a, a problem in science in that the information, you know, that's collected with a lot of effort uh, becomes less and less useful with time if it's not adequately described. And it's not just for the purposes of other people who may reuse your data, but also for, for your own, uh, for, your, for yourself to be able to, you know, understand, interpret, and, and reuse the data. So I don't imagine people here have gotten back to a spreadsheet and not really been able to remember what a particular column meant or, or why they did something. So yes, yeah, so I, I do want to emphasize that this, you know, essentially good data hygiene benefits you first. And you know your supervisor and collaborators, and finally something that, that you know as a user of other people's data, 
I appreciate, well, not just for myself, but because I see that there's a lot of power in, in synthetic research and it's becoming more and more evident. So making data available for reuse in, in larger scale syntheses will make science, you know, enable science that would otherwise not be possible. Um, so what is metadata? So there's all this information that, that you might wanna know about metadata. You can think about it as almost everything except for that particular data point, except for like the height is, you know, five meters. Um, other than that, you know, once you ask the question of like, well, the height, the height of what? Well, this, you know, species, this oak tree over here was, was five meters tall and where was it and when was it? Okay, how did you measure it? Usually height is, it almost doesn't matter. You may think it doesn't matter. In some cases it does, but you might think, okay, height, it's easy to tell. There's no questions about it, but there's a lot of things, a lot of, um, of uh, values that it really does matter how the how the um, how the data was measured. For I'll give one example that I imagine Camille is familiar with is the leaf area index, or the number of leaves, you know, the number of layers of leaves above a, above the ground. Well, if you go out and you measure that by chopping down a forest and and taking the area of all the leaves, then you've got a pretty direct measurement. But if you measure it through by looking at the reflectance of the surface of the earth and using an equation to estimate the leaf area index, then you will, uh, then those are very different. Those have very different meanings, even though they might be the same. Um, other very important information is, you know, how is it structured? What, you know, when you look at this file that I was looking at, you know, that I was showing earlier, um, you know, what, what, uh, how is it structured? What, does it, what are the variable names? Who collected it? Who gets credit? And also, how can the data be reused? If you don't provide people information about whether they can reuse it or not, even if you wanted to get reused, giving them the permission is important. Um, so the README. If you see the README, you should read it. And if you have data, you should write it. It's a very simple in concept text file. It's got a number of you know, consistent components that, that answer those questions that, that we just went through. So the bibliographic deca details, the information about what, you, what was being measured, the, all of the interpretation details should be available in a readme file. <clears throat> um, you know, and you may you may have one README for overall for the project and then a different README for each data set. And another thing that people may not think about is that you can actually have you know a separate worksheet in your spreadsheet that's your README that has your variable definitions that, that describes all of this. And later you can copy and paste that into a text file. But often it's it's useful to have it, you know, a text file that, that can be available easy for people to read um, in addition to having it where you're developing your data in the, in the spreadsheet. Um, so let's see. So the, the University of Arizona library has, um, and it's easy to Google for you know, examples of README, but they've got, you know, they've got a, some definitions of what should be in your, your, um, your README, but also uh, sample README's. So things that you can, um, you can download as a template <clears throat> and, and describe your data with, with sufficient detail. <coughs> um, yeah, so, so that, that, that's a good place to start. And then I already went through and showed this example of the, of the NEON data sets that we're covering as an example of a, of a README. Um, this README actually has some images of where things came in, uh, where things are available some basic exploratory data analysis and summaries of the data and time series. So this is to make it available, you know, make it accessible to our collaborators. Um, okay. So you should, when you see something that says README, you should read it. And when you're collecting your data, you should uh, write your README, not uh, when you're getting to the point of 
archiving your data, but as you're collecting the data, it's the same, or at least write this information down in a lab notebook if that's where you prefer. So there's another question of, it comes up of standards and conventions, vocabularies. So at, we, we talked using the example of spreadsheets, we talked a lot about you know having column names and making them <clears throat> and describing what's in them. So when you get to more complicated data, so for example, an image or you know a satellite image or a point cloud that is a three-dimensional representation of, of a you know of the land surface, for example. <coughs> um, well, those, those won't fit effectively into that information doesn't fit effectively into a table. You could coerce it that way, but then it's much more difficult. Um, so fortunately, so in those for those examples, the, the OGC, the Open Geospatial Consortium, has come up with a, a huge, a very long list of standard file formats, not just uh, for those data sets, but, but for other mm -hmm. ones. And so what it allows is for different software programs to be able to read the same data. And so it already knows what to expect. I was mentioning earlier, like having, you know, if you limit it to three columns rather than adding a new column for each species, your script will be able to pull in that data even as you extend it and, and make use of that data. Um, this is at a whole different scale where, you know, it's not just saying these columns must be named the same, but it's saying, you know, this is the structure of the data and people can, you know, build up very uh, elaborate re, uh, software projects like, you know, ArcGIS or, or MATLAB or, um, uh, you know, command line tools for processing these data that can always understand what's happening inside of there. There's some other things that are, that are useful about, about these file formats related there, the efficiency with which the data can be accessed, as well as the ability to store information about the data inside the, the file itself uh, to make it useful. And I'll show an example of that in a second. Um, there's a few other things here, which are you know conventions that are coming up about defining, you know, in order to make your data useful for this community. So in the case of, um, ICASA LD, that um, it's an agronomic, you know, it's like a way of consistently storing agronomic information. It, ma it makes it so that the people who are collecting the data can put it in a format that's readily accessible for crop models. And also, it kind of defines the scope of the data that's required to, you know, to make use of these, um, these data sets, which it, can be different for different applications, but if we look at the context, you know, for example, with with crop models, it says this is the minimum information I need to, you know, to uh, to run or calibrate or validate a um, a crop model. So that's why that was was built. Um, I won't go a lot, you know, through many more of these, but I wanted to give a list of some that I think might be might be uh, folks in this, you know, in cows generally might be familiar with. Um, so next is is protocol. So we talked earlier a little bit about having data sets. I mean, having a README that's you know that describes the methods. But then I don't know um, how many people here have ever been able to read a scientific publication and reproduce the methods that were in that scientific publication without referring to some other uh, textbook or or figuring, you know, doing a lot of hard work on their own. Um, so, so that that's a common way of saying, well, we we use their method, modified it a little bit with whatever own equipment we had. Uh, but it's not that useful. So then, usually, labs will have documents, the step-by-step -step procedures um, that that lab uses. But it, commonly, or at least a decade ago, when I was working in in labs. You know, these things would be within the lab and maybe available on the lab website, but it's it would be difficult for somebody to point to that um, protocol and say, well, we use that, but we adopted it like this. And here's kind of, again, the provenance of, of how we've adapted that for, for our own studies. So there's some new approaches. There's some new tools that, that you can use. So I talked a little bit about version control, um, GitHub, and OSF, and, and the wiki there. 
But next, I wanted to talk a little bit, I wanted to talk more in detail about this tool called protocols.io, which, you know, for laboratory protocols, it does a lot of what GitHub does for software, but for, for lab protocols, as far as allowing you to, you know, publish a protocol, get a, a unique identifier, essentially a citation to it, and somebody else can look at that, try and reproduce it, modify it, and, and, and as they modify it, they trace the, you know, the provenance traces back to the original protocol. Um, so I'm going to get, I'll, I'll give a little quick view of that. But the key content, similar to the README, is, you know, the bibliographic information and what was actually done, as well as very importantly, like what, what could go wrong and any references that, that this was developed out of. So to talk about uh, protocols.io, um, well, here's one example of a of a um, of a uh, of a protocol that that I put on protocols.io. So that be, mainly because I was looking at it and trying to figure out how it could be useful for for a project that I was involved in, <clears throat> and it is very useful. It's a little bit more overhead than just writing out a a, a document, but I think that it's got a lot of, um, of potential, especially for protocols that will be reused. And down here is the copy and fork, um, is the copy and fork like thing so that you can you know, take your own version and, and modify it. And if we look in here, um, you can see it's got kind of the instructions, some of the equations that were used you know, these, these are very specific for this project, explaining what, what we were doing with this protocol. And then it's also got, um, you know, the materials that were used, it links directly to this specific, you know, piece of equipment. And then the metadata includes a way in which this can be cited, um, as well as the original reference um, that the method was developed from. So that's another tool. So I, I pointed out DMP tool earlier, protocols.io is very, you know, very promising. Um, uh, way of, of putting your, making your protocols more broadly available and, and reusable. And it's free for anybody to use if you keep your protocols public. Um, to keep them private, it requires a, uh, uh, I think private and share it, it requires you to uh, buy a subscription. Okay, so the last part of this is the preservation step. And this is also where, I mean, at all of these steps, I'd say the campus experts are at the library. Um, my, I and my group can help provide a lot of the domain specific kind of, I guess, um, you know, applied uh, interpretation of, of the big picture best practices that, that and guidance that, that you might have uh, get from the library. But I can't say enough about how how great the folks that I've met at the library here are, and also, you know, at other institutions I've been since I realized what a great resource they are. So they, I mean, they're really, um, they're experts and they're, they've got a lot of um, tools and uh, information about how to make your data reusable. Uh, so, so finally, so, and this is really, you know, one of the places that they can really help with is when you want to um, store your data. I've talked a lot about uh, file types earlier, you know, the key thing is that you want um, formats that are open and documented and can be read by any, any, any software program. There's a lot of, um, there are a lot of file types that are, that are more efficient to use, easier, like essentially if you're using R, you might end up with an R data, for, uh, R data file. MATLAB has something analogous and Python has its, um, I forget the name of these um, pickles. Python has its pickles. Those are all very software specific and they're very efficient, but it doesn't, but R can't read a pickle. They can both read a text file and they can both read a, all of these other uh, formats, including uh, CSVs. So, and, you know, in, in, uh, you know, in 30 years, so Excel can be a text file 
so not unlike 10 years ago when it was when it was propri truly proprietary now you can dump all the information out in a, from excel except that it won't come in you won't get a table you'll get like this crazy thing that looks like you know that's xml it's very hard to reconstruct and so that's why csv is preferred over excel is that there's no reason to think in 30 years that some software will be able to read excel whereas you should be able to expect it can read uh, it will be able to read csv and it's really only recently that that even R has been able to read directly from Excel without a lot of headaches. I think that's been in the past five years or so. Um, okay, so, and then the next question is, so which repositories? There's a lot of options out there. And again, this is a place where your, um, you know, the librarian can help, journal or funding agency may have some, uh, some requirements or, or suggestions. Uh, here's one example from Nature Scientific Data. They go through and they say, you know, for this type of data, put it here or here or here. They give you options for each domain and each type of data. Um, and then there's also, you know, there's more generalist, the general, generalist repositories. So uh, Figshare is one. And the University of Arizona Library, um, their new repository is, is built on Figshare. And by generalist, I mean, you can put anything there. You can put any files and it's pretty easy and it's a relatively, um, it's a low bar. They don't require a lot of domain specific information. Earlier, I was talking about minimum required metadata for a particular application. So this would, you know, we'll say kind of the core metadata, but it won't, it may not have all of the information required, for example, for, for a particular scientific use case. So that's where a generic repository won't have as much constraint over the type of information that must be provided or the types of files that, that must be provided as, as a domain specific one. Um, so I'd say usually if your data will fit into a domain specific repository, that's where it should go. Um, also wanted to have a, a few minutes to talk about licensing and copyright. So, As I mentioned earlier, having a license or terms of reuse or copyright, you know, having it in your README is important because if you don't have it, then people won't assume that they can reuse it. So there's a very common, um, you know, it's very common for people to, to allow reuse with attribution. So for, for most, most materials other than software, that would be the, the Creative Commons um, CC BY 4.0 is essentially saying anybody can reuse it as long as they say where it came from. In software, the equivalent is the MIT, BSD, and Apache license licenses. These are, you know, there's a whole family of, of, um, of, uh, of these licenses that, that are called permissive license, permissive licenses. Is it allows people to reuse it. Um, you have to keep the the um, uh, the, uh, the the license available, but you don't. It's not like GPL three, which I don't recommend, and it you know it it makes barriers to the reuse of the of the information. I don't recommend unless there's a reason to use it, and there there's plenty of people who have reasons to use it, including wanting to make it free for use by you know for non-commercial use essentially dual licensing um, or just restricting its, its reuse. And that's, you know, there's definitely reasons to do it, but I, I, um, I wouldn't say that shouldn't be the first choice unless there is a compelling reason to do it. And then the next step is, is putting your information into the public domain. So there is a, um, I'll start with the software. I said NA, so there is a way of putting your, I mean, you can put the software into the public domain, but when I started researching that, it was there's some some caveats about where the legalities of software licensing public domain is kind of uh, it makes it so it's not really easily reusable. Um, but with data, you can put it under CC0, and some repositories require CC0. And the reason is that we're at a point where we don't we can't track the provenance of data easily enough. Uh, to, to um, uh, so at some point, I mean, there's all sorts of problems when you think about 
you know, the third derivation of data, who gets cited for that? And it's, um, it's, a complex, it's a complex problem that people smarter than I are trying to figure out. But the easiest way to make your data, you know, most widely reused is, is to make it a CC0. So that doesn't have this legal requirement that people acknowledge the source of the data. However, that, uh, the argument for using CC0 and, and um, Drya has a, has a great you know, explanation on this, is that CC's like, you shouldn't rely on the legal system to enforce you know, scientific best practices or, or you know, scientific conventions of saying where you got your data from, from, from referencing um, or citing the source of, your, of, of the data. So, so something that CC0 doesn't mean that you don't need to cite it. It's, um, but at the same time, you know, uh, people may feel less, com you know, may feel less comfortable with the CC0. And that's why a lot of things are, are released CC by, especially things like teaching materials or, or, or writings, et cetera. Um, people don't want to just put it into the public domain, but for, you know, for data, it's, that's the way to make it the most free. Um, and so that, that was a lot. Um, and now I am at the, uh, at my, my relatively brief conclusion, which is that data management is hard, but it's rewarding. So with that, as promised, here's some, some resources that I, uh, have described in this in this talk and some of the references that I provided. Somehow, I feel I, I missed a couple. I just realized I missed a few slides. And um, now, if you want to follow up with with me or my group, here's this is my email. Um, and we've started having open office hours on on Tuesday mornings from from eight to ten, where people can just drop in and, and chat. I didn't put the information up here, but I can I can provide that. So I can open up to, to questions. Thank you so very much, David. 